Well, this beautiful painting that is on the altar this morning was painted by one of our church members. Uh, this was painted by Paul Burdick, who is such a wonderful artist. Uh, and Paul has so generously gifted this painting to our church. Um, Paul is in the Friendship Hall today. So thank you, Paul. It's such a, a lovely gift, and it's such a beautiful uh, reminder to us of the symbolism of the nativity. Now, the nativity scene, of course, has been painted in many beautiful and famous works of art, and it gets to the heart of what Advent's all about. We are preparing ourselves. We're awaiting the birth of the light. That's what Advent is all about. So it's interesting, then, that we haven't been hearing from our lectionary readings stories about Joseph and Mary and the baby Jesus. Instead, we've been hearing the past couple of weeks about John the Baptist. Now, why is the church having us do this? Because, you know, when I think of Christmas, I don't really think of John the Baptist. I never see him in any holiday displays. I've never gotten a Christmas card with John the Baptist on it. I don't think there are any Christmas carols about John the Baptist. So why does the church have us focus on John the Baptist during Advent? Why are our readings these past couple of weeks about him? Well, I told you at the beginning of Advent, Advent is not really about the birth of the baby Jesus. It isn't. Advent is about the coming of the light. And John the Baptist was the very first person to proclaim that the light was on its way. And he was preparing people for the coming of the light. Now, John the Baptist was a man who was so full of light himself that many people thought that he was the Messiah. But he assured them, I am not the Messiah. There's someone coming who is even more full of light than I am. And he said, this person is in our midst. And that person, of course, was Jesus. And I think it's important for us to remember, because I think sometimes we forget, that Jesus and John the Baptist were contemporaries. They were around the same age. In fact, Jesus was a follower of John the Baptist. The group of people who followed John the Baptist around, Jesus was among that group. And I think we also forget this. John the Baptist and Jesus were cousins. Many of you know that story from Luke's gospel, which is known as the visitation. The visitation was where Jesus' mother, Mary, is visited by her cousin, Elizabeth. And both women are pregnant at the same time, Mary is pregnant with Jesus, and her cousin Elizabeth is pregnant with John the Baptist. And both of these pregnancies are miraculous ones. Mary's because she's a virgin, and Elizabeth's because Elizabeth is really old. She's well past childbearing age. Some stories say she was 90 when she gave birth. Now, all of this may sound very far-fetched to you, and I know that we as progressive Christians sometimes have a hard time wrapping ourselves around these stories. But remember, I have told you many times before, the stories in Scripture are not meant to be understood literally. They are stories that are meant to be understood symbolically, spiritually. And stories of virgin births were not uncommon in the ancient world. They were meant to, to indicate that the person being born was special, that they had a prophetic nature, that they were divinely appointed by God. And so that's what the gospel writers are trying to tell us. They're trying to tell us that both John the Baptist and Jesus were divinely appointed by God to be prophets to the nations. So if John and Jesus were cousins, and they were born around the same time, it would make sense that they grew up together. But John the Baptist 
began his ministry first. Before Jesus even began teaching at the age of 30, John the Baptist was already out there. He was teaching and preaching, and he was amassing a huge following. John inspired a great movement of people. And what they were doing was they were trying to bring about a new world order. They were fighting for justice and reform. As we heard in our words of integration and guidance this morning, the world in which Jesus and John lived is not very different from the world we're living in today. It was a world, as we heard, that was being held upside down by the people at the top that had all of the wealth and all of the power. It was a world in which political leaders weren't held accountable for their actions. A world in which people were being denied their basic human rights. This is a story, though, that we hear throughout the Bible. I mean, if you think about the stories of the Bible, they are mainly about groups of people who are being oppressed by political regimes and religious authorities. And the stories of the Bible are about those oppressed groups rising up and resisting those authorities and regimes. It is why the, the Christian writer Rachel Held Evans, who, who unfortunately died last year, she said, the Bible is literature for the resistance. The Bible is literature for the resistance. That is so true, and I love that. But that's what John the Baptist was doing. He was, he was leading this resistance movement. Before Jesus even came on the scene, John the Baptist was out there amassing this huge following, and he was proclaiming, a light is on its way, a new world is coming, a new kingdom, let's prepare ourselves for it. That's what he was out there doing. Now, of course, that got him in a lot of trouble with the powers that be. They didn't like that. And that's why in today's gospel, John the Baptist is in prison. That's what we heard. And if you know the story, you know that shortly, John the Baptist is going to be beheaded by King Herod. Now, that's not something we want to hear around Christmas time. We don't. But the church wants us to focus on John the Baptist uh, before Christmas because John the Baptist paved the way for Jesus. John's ministry foreshadowed Jesus' ministry. They both had miraculous births. They both led great movements of people. They both were trying to bring about this new kingdom, this new world order. And they were both silenced, arrested, and killed by the powers that be. So what is it that they were doing that made them so dangerous? Well, they were both proclaiming a world in which, in their words, the rich and powerful would be pulled down from their thrones and the lowly would be lifted up high. They said it was going to be a world where the last were going to be first and the first were going to be last. And it was going to be a world where the least of these would be given the most importance. So in other, world, other words, what they were doing is they were trying to proclaim that this new world was on its way, a world of justice. That's why the front cover of your bulletin today says, Heartbeat of Justice, and it shows Mary and Elizabeth and the heartbeats of justice that are beating in their unborn children, Jesus and John the Baptist. Now, if we truly are to call ourselves Christians, followers of the way, then we too have to be about that, which means that our role while we are here on earth is to continue that work of following the way, creating that new world order, bringing about social justice, where to feed the hungry, where to care for the sick, where to welcome the stranger, and we are to create a world where the least of these are given the most importance, where they come first. Now, of course, that's going to get us in trouble. Okay. But again, John the Baptist was beheaded. Jesus was crucified. 
Uh, More recently in the 20th century, we know Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. Oscar Romero was slain. It's why the Jesuit priest and social activist Daniel Berrigan once said, if you really want to follow the way of Jesus, you better look good on wood. Now, of course, we don't want to hear that at Christmas time. We want to sit in the safety and security of our pew, and we want to just worship the little baby. We don't really want to go out in the world and do as he did. We don't. But then we really can't call ourselves Christians. Because our call as Christians is to do as Jesus did. Jesus was a revolutionary. Jesus was trying to bring about radical social change. And if we truly are to be followers of his way, we have to go and do the same. So what does this have to do with Advent? Well, if you heard in today's gospel reading, Jesus said, There has been no one greater than John the Baptist, but the least of these is greater than he is. That's what Advent is about. That's why we're focusing on John the Baptist. Because we are to do what John and Jesus did. We are to create a world where the least of these come first. Where we care about their needs before we care about our own needs. Advent is a time of preparation. We're not preparing a birthday party for the baby. We're preparing for the way. For the light that's on its way. For the new world that's coming the new kingdom. That's what we're preparing for. We're preparing for a world of peace and hope and joy and love. Those are what the four Advent candles stand for. So today we're focusing on joy. And as I said at the beginning of the service, many of you don't feel very joyful right now with the darkness that's happening in our nation and our world. But scripture says, do not be dismayed by the ways of the world, by the darkness. It says, a light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. That's the good news of great joy for all people. That we, the people in darkness, have seen a great light. That light is with us and within us. In Isaiah chapter 58, verse 10, it says, When you feed the hungry and you lift up the oppressed, the light in you becomes greater than the darkness. That's what we're doing in Advent. When we do works of justice, we are birthing the light. We are, we are bringing the light into the world. That light is our hope That light is our joy. That light is with us and within us. So this Advent season, let every heart prepare room for that light. For the light is on its way. Namaste.